Good afternoon. I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And tonight, we're adumbrating Chapter 21 in Kennedy, Cohen, and Bailey's The American Pageant Textbook, The Furnace of the Civil War. Abe, take it away. Okay. Abe Lincoln's paramount purpose for the war was to save the Union. Lincoln believed a successful attack on the Confederate station at Bull Run would demonstrate the Union's superiority and possibly even lead to the capture of Richmond, the Confederate capital. But during the war, during the battle, Stonewall Jackson won his nickname by standing strong and eventually routing the Union troops. So Bull Run was a Confederate victory, but there were some adverse effects for the Confederacy. Many Southern soldiers des deserted and Southern enlistment plunged. For the Union, however, the battle proved the South's competence and pushed the Union to focus all, focus all its effort on the war itself. Now, Frank, could you tell me about George McClellan and the Peninsula Campaign? Absolutely. So in 1861, command was handed down to George McClellan, a perfectionist with the nasty habit of never taking risks and always believing himself to be outnumbered. To this end, he only actually began to lead the army on the attack after Lincoln accused him of having the slows. Eventually, he embarked on the so-called Peninsula Campaign. And unfortunately, this mission was a failure, since forces peeled off to first attack Stonewall Jackson, and then the main squadron was then slaughtered by Lee in the Seven Days Battles. Since this plan to capture Richmond had failed completely, the North now turned to total war, which had six pieces. First, use a blockade to destroy the South's economy. Second, undermine the South's fundamental economic tool, slavery. Third, control the South's main transport artery at the Mississippi. Fourth, invade Georgia and the Carolinas. Fifth, capture the Southern capital at Richmond. And sixth and finally, try to fight the South's big armies rather than its small diversionary forces to, quote, grind it into submission. Abe, can you inform us about the naval component of the Civil War? I would be glad to. Overall, even though the Union wisely chose to focus its blockade on the major southern ports, the blockade was never entirely effective and it had several gaping holes. Britain, wanting to avoid future war, did formally recognize and respect the blockade, however. To subvert the blockade, swift ships known as blockade runners were employed. These ships rendezvoused at the port of Nassau and traded armaments with the South in exchange for cotton. This was a high risk trade, but it, in turn it was highly profitable. The North enforced this blockade strictly and would seize British sheep, ships carrying arms even if those ships weren't traveling directly to the Confederacy. Eventually the Southerners refurbished the powerful Merrimack, which single-handedly threatened the entire Northern blockade. So the Union retaliated and built the Monitor in ironclad. Then, the Monitor and the Merrimack faced off, and following their battle, the Merrimack never again posed a threat to the Union blockade. Now, Frank, you know I love sequels. Was there a part two to any of the Civil War battles? You bet there was, Abe. It was time for the Battle of Bull Run, Round 2. And once again, the Southerners slaughtered their Northern opposition. Not only that, but Lee proceeded to advance into the North itself. His hope was to gain support from Europe and the border states. In a state of panic, Lincoln reinstated McClellan, whose men discovered a copy of Lee's plans. This allowed the North to hold back the Confederates at the Battle of Antietam, one of the most important events in American history. If the South had won, France and England might have come to their aid. The victory allowed Lincoln to publish his Emancipation Proclamation, which declared all slaves in Confederate-held territories free. This act bolstered Northern morale and decreased the likelihood of foreign intervention. Abe, can you tell me, what was the effect of this Emancipation Proclamation? All right. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamations freed slaves in the rebelling Confederate regions, but left in bondage the slaves in the border states. So because of this, no slaves were formally freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Overall, the proclamation destroyed any remaining chances for negotiated settlement between the North and the South. However, after hearing of the proclamation, many slaves fled and joined the Union armies. 
the Northerners slowly began to realize the reality of slavery's evils, and Lincoln began to more seriously consider complete emancipation. Finally, in 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified. Some applauded these abolitionist policies under Lincoln, while others believed Lincoln had gone too far. However, Union desertions increased sharply since many opposed a coalition war. The South, of course, was furious with the 13th Amendment. Aristocrats of Europe, for the most part, supported the South, while the working classes of Europe were incited to oppose slavery more vehemently than ever. Lastly, the 13th Amendment gave the North a much more powerful moral cause over the South. Now, Frank, how prominent were blacks in the Union armies? Well, in the opening stages of the war, blacks weren't allowed to enlist in the Union army. But by 1864, they comprised 10% of northern forces. The South, on the other hand, refused to view blacks as prisoners of war when they surrendered, and often simply murdered them as runaway slaves. Meanwhile, in the South, slaves were forced to build fortifications and supply the front lines. They also kept the farms going while the whites fought, though they tried to work as slowly as possible and employ cautious resistance to their master's commands. Abe, when I say the words incompetent general, what pops into your mind? Well, I must say that General Burnside is pretty high on my list. General Burnside replaced McClellan after the Battle of Antietam, and Burnside quickly proved his incompetence when he rashly attacked General Lee at the Battle of Fredericksburg, where the Union suffered over 10,000 casualties. So Joseph Hooker was appointed to replace Burnside, and Hooker was attacked by Lee at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Chancellorsville was probably Lee's most brilliant victory, but unfortunately for the South, Stonewall Jackson was killed shortly after the battle. So Lee longed for a decisive victory to reinvigorate the peace advocates in the North and further encourage Southern, a foreign intervention. So he met, with, he met Union General Meade at the Battle of Gettysburg. The charge of Confederate General Pickett during the battle marked the northernmost point ever reached by the South and was essentially the last chance for the South to win the war. But Gettysburg was a Union victory, and from that point on, the Southern cause was doomed. Lincoln also delivered the Gettysburg Address, which was impugned as silly, and attracted very little attention at the time. But Frank, could you tell me about one competent general of the North? Absolutely. Finally, an able Northern general stepped into the limelight in the shape of Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant proved himself able right off the bat, capturing Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. Grant followed up these victories with a drive into Tennessee, but was defeated at the Battle of Shiloh. Thousands of miles away, the Union was scoring other successes. Farragut, General Farragut, had managed to capture New Orleans, and at Vicksburg, the Union naval forces secured control of the Mississippi River, thus cutting the South in two. These battles were key, uh, key in detracting foreign intervention uh, into the Civil War, as both Britain and France canceled warship sails and turned their backs upon the South. Thank you for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe, and comment down below if you have any questions. We'll catch you guys next, next time. time.